So today's topic was recommended by Jed over in the Game Master's Vault Facebook group. He asked for tips on how to run his group of seven players more efficiently. He says he barely gets through one combat encounter per session. So really, what's a large group? I mean, RPGs are typically designed for four to five players at the most. So if you start talking about seven, eight, nine, ten, twelve players at your table, you're dealing with a large group. Now I like to think of it as it's only a large group if you think it's right on the edge or more than you can handle as a GM. Most GMs have a sweet spot of the number of players that they like at their table for their campaigns, whether that's three players or five players or eight players. Some people like GMing for that many players. So when it comes to running for large groups, a lot of GMs will tell you, don't do it. And I'm one of those GMs. I don't think that you should be running for a very large group, especially if you're a new GM. If you're more experienced, you can probably handle bigger groups, seven, eight, nine. Once you get above that, though, it gets really unwieldy. There's lots of reasons why I don't think that you should run for large groups. First of all, think of it as a player. If you're a player and you, you have your turn in the combat, in the encounter, it could easily be another 15 minutes before it's your turn again. Now, for me, that's a lot of time to get bored, to want to play on my phone. Maybe I'm stacking my dice. Maybe I'm talking to the person next to me about the latest Avengers movie, whatever. Boredom is going to start to set in for those players when it takes an exorbitant amount of time for them between their actions. Secondly, it when you have a large group as a GM it becomes much more difficult to focus on individual characters. If you go through a really good session zero you've already come up with that player a really cool backstory for that character. If you've got a lot of players at the table the likelihood of that you're gonna dig into that backstory and come up with really cool character arcs for every single player at your table goes down and down and down. Now, Guy over at the How to Be a Great GM channel um, made a really cool observation. If you have something that would normally take four players uh, about an hour to accomplish, whether it's a combat encounter or whatever, for every additional player that you add, you're typically adding another 20 minutes to the time that it'll take them to complete that task. There's more skill checks, there's more dice rolls, there's more description, you have more people giving speeches, all of those kind of things that are just going to stretch everything out and make everything last much longer than it should at your table. My name is Mike and this is the Game Master's Vault and today we're going to talk about GMing for larger groups uh, in your RPGs. I've got a whole bunch of tips that you could use, strategies that you could use in your games to hopefully help speed things up a little bit, just like Jed had asked for. We'll talk about that when we go into the GM's Vault. Now usually most GMs start with just four or five players, maybe six, and they're good. But one of your players wants to let their friend join in, or a significant other, their spouse, or um, my, my son wants to get into playing um, Dungeons and Dragons or Pathfinder or whatever as well, and so your party, your number of players starts to grow. So I've broken these tips down into two basic sections. One of them is things that you can do as a game master before the game even starts, before you start your campaign, um, or specifically before a game session itself. 
So here we've got about six different tips um, that I'll share with you. First of all, before you ever start a campaign and you know that you're going to have a large group of players, the first and most important thing is never use a brand new role playing system that you are not familiar with and your players are not familiar with. If you decide that you want to play Fate or Call of Cthulhu and you've only played Dungeons and Dragons before, as a GM you may kind of know what's going on, but there's a, there's a learning curve with every RPG that your players just simply aren't going to know and explaining the rules to them, how this works, how that works, what roles are required, all that's going to take a lot of time at your table. So don't use a new system. Um, I would also recommend not having brand new players in a large group uh, campaign. When you're talking about a, a newbie player, again, they're going to have to learn all of these rules. They're going to have to have more time spent on them. Sure, you can do some of that stuff outside of actual game time, but like I said, if they're waiting for 15 minutes between their actions and all that kind of stuff, they're not going to be having as much fun as they probably would if you only had four or five, maybe six characters in a campaign. So keep the newbies out of the really big groups, if at all possible. Not that they're bad, not that we shouldn't help them in their RPG journey to be better role players and better gamers. We absolutely should do that. But a very large group is not the place to do that. If they don't have fun at their games, they may not continue in our hobby. They may not search out a different campaign. They may not search out a different GM, any of that kind of stuff. So we want to keep them active and involved, and it's much harder to do with a large group. The second thing to do before the game, um, we've done videos about session zero before. And in a normal session zero, you go through all the steps that we talked about in that video. But when you know that you're going to have a large group, there's extra things that you need to talk about during session zero. And that most importantly is the social contract. You need to convey to your players that it is more important than in a normal game with a normal number of players that everyone has a cooperative group mentality. You can't have the lone wolf in a large group. It's just going to cause a lot of problems down the road. So if all your players are all on board that, you know, sometimes I'm not going to get my way and I'm going to have to go do this thing, if they're willing to even if it doesn't make sense, if they're willing to do that just to help speed everything up, then that's the way that you need to go. You need to talk about that during session zero so that everybody is on board and, and they're all going in the same direction. Number three before a campaign starts is you should find an assistant GM or a co-GM that you can work with during the games and, and outside of the games as well. You each should have your own defined duties of what you're going to do during the game and for the game. You may have uh, one, of the, one of the GMs that their only focus is on the combat. So they're going to draw maps uh, for the combat encounters. They're going to come up with the monsters, that kind of thing. Um, the other person may be more about story and NPC interaction. Um, who's going to figure out the amount of loot and what kind of things are going on. So when you have a co-GM uh, or an assistant GM, you can work on all of those things and get everything kind of ironed out and take less time and energy off of your plate if you were trying to run a game by yourself for a large group. The fourth thing is to try to split the group into two if at all possible. Now I know that many people will argue, well, all of my players can only meet on Wednesday nights or whatever, or they all want to play together. 
if there's no other way around it, then that's fine. Go with a bigger group. But if you can, if they can only meet on Wednesday nights, if they're willing to work together and to be able to do alternate Wednesday nights, then you can run, you can run the same campaign, same kind of storyline for both groups, just on alternate nights. They can be in the same world. They could be at the same time. They could know of the other adventurers, the other group. Um, that are in your world, that's perfectly fine. But if you can split them up into two groups of four or a group of four and five or two groups of six, that's just going to help with all the story and the interaction. And I think that the players would get much more joy out of the game. So if you can, split it into two different groups. If you can't, you can't. Uh, number five is you need to think about your specific campaign, your overarching story, um, if you know that you're going to be GMing for a large group. You need to do certain things in your campaign that you wouldn't have to do with a normal size group. Things like uh, to think about are, are you going to have less combat? How are you going to increase uh, player interaction where they're interacting with each other as opposed to having to take time to deal with NPCs and all of that kind of stuff as much. So think about designing your campaign and how you're going to do it uh, specifically for a larger group. Number six, uh, the final thing before games is you are going to have to prep more if you have a larger group of players. One of the big things is with maps. Um, in my games, I don't use maps. I have 3D terrain. I have boards, and they're all set up with 3D terrain. Now, even in my campaigns, where I only have five players in each of my campaigns, I still do the boards ahead of time. You can do the maps ahead of time. I have a special shelf uh, over on the side where um, I'll plan out, you know, two, three, four encounters ahead of time, and those boards are already made up. They're already on a shelf. So when it gets time to do that encounter, I bring the board over, put it on the table, boom, I'm done. If you're doing maps and you have a large group and you only have one dry erase, wet erase uh, map, and you have to clean it off and draw the new map in between encounters, one, that's a good thing for an assistant GM or a co-GM to do um, as you do story narration and that kind of thing. Um, but you can make those maps up ahead of time as well. If you've only got one dry or wet erase map and you, you just can't do it that way, after every holiday, you can probably go and find uh, wrapping paper out there. If you haven't noticed, if, if you're like me and you haven't actually wrapped a present in a long time, on the other side of that wrapping paper is a one inch grid. Draw it out, cut it to the right size, whatever you need, and boom, all your maps are going to be all done ahead of time. It's going to save you time during the game to try and draw stuff out. Some people will say, well, if you have a, a board or a map and you plop it down, well, then the players are going to see everything. There's no fog of war or whatever. And I'm like, so what? So they can see everything that's in this wilderness encounter. That's perfectly fine if they see all that stuff. They're still going to have to defeat the monsters or the villains or, or, the, or the terrain uh, environmental stuff that I put in there that they may not know about, they're still going to have to defeat that. It doesn't matter if they see the map or not. So anyway, do your maps. Um, prep more uh, ahead of time. You'll have to spend a little bit more time prep uh, when you're doing a big group. So those are some things that you can do before the game or before the campaign starts. Now comes the big one of things that you as a GM can do during the game. So the first thing, and these are in no particular order, by the way. I'm just, just throwing this crap up against the wall. Whatever sticks, sticks. If you find something that you like, use it. If you think that it's stupid, then don't use it. That's entirely up to you. So the first thing is you should get your players um, um, used to 
rolling their d20 and their damage dice at the same time. If you have a fighter and he knows that he's going to go up to the monster and he's going to smack it with his sword and his sword does a d8, there's no reason why he can't roll a d20 and the d8 at the same time and tell you, the GM, on his turn, I'm going to go up and I'm going to smack it with my sword and if a 17 hits, it does 9 damage. Pretty simple and easy to do, and your players will get used to doing that. Um, that will actually save a lot of time versus rolling a d20. Does it hit? Yes or no? And then you need to find the other damage dice. Then you got to look up your modifier, and all that kind of stuff takes a long time, and that's time that you don't have when you're dealing with a large group. So, rolling your attack and damage dice at the same time is number one. Number two. Um, guy over on the uh, How to Be a Great GM channel um, does the five or six second countdown timer. You'll have to do this for a little while for your players to get used to knowing that they need to hurry up and tell you what they're doing as, as a character. He'll start counting down. Five, four, three, two, one. What are you doing? You've only got five seconds to start telling me what your character is going to do or you're going to be skipped and we're going to the next guy. It's just that simple. We're just going to skip your turn if you're not ready. So that's going to start to um, condition your players into telling you what they want to do quickly. Number three, we'll talk about initiative um, a little bit. During the game, I believe that you should be using, with a large group, initiative both in and out of combat. That way you make sure that everyone is getting a chance to tell you that their character is doing something, even if they're out of combat. I want to go and inspect the fireplace. I want to go do this. I want to talk to this person. Those kind of things. And everybody still gets an opportunity to be involved and engaged in the story if you keep initiative even outside of combat. Rolling for initiative can take a lot of time if you're talking 10 players, 12 players, or whatever. That's a lot of dice rolling, a lot of numbers being written down, all that kind of stuff. So if you want to really speed up initiative, and this will have to be approved by your players during session zero, don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to force anything on the players, but what you can do um, is roll initiative at the beginning of the night. And that is your initiative order until you take a break. Now, most of us are playing for three, four, five hours, six hours at a time. So whenever you take a break, then you will re-roll initiative and that will go until the next break or the end of the game, uh, however long you're playing. So you only have to roll initiative once and that's it until you take a break. So that will help speed things up as well. You're not stopping for every single encounter to roll initiative, all that kind of stuff. Um, you can get a player to help you. This is something that you can do with a lot of different things is get the players to help you. Have a player help you track initiative. Have that player say, okay, Joe, you're up next, and then Steve, you're after that, Sally, um, you're after that, and keep everybody going and moving and all that kind of stuff. Getting player help is really a good thing to do. Um, in one of our other videos, I talked about player organization and how we do the folders and notebook idea. This is actually our initiative tree that we use uh, in our game, and Every player has a different colored folder and a notebook, and that will match up to the different colored clothespin that is on this initiative tree. And I have typically one player will help me as we're doing initiative, and they'll put the, the correct order of the um, initiative on this little tree, and this sits out there for the players to see. Now, since everybody has the matching color folder and notebook as their clothespin, even if they can't read it, um, Cameron, for example, would know that this blue clothespin is his. Ethan would know the black one is his, and so on and so forth. And I use orange ones for bad guys. I've got brown ones for NPCs, and I would just label them NPC 1 or 2 or whatever. 
And this works really well for your players to visualize what order the initiative is going in if you don't have somebody calling that out to know who is up next and that kind of thing. Another great thing for initiative is these Pathfinder combat pads. This is a, a dry or wet erase pad that you can keep notes of hit points and stuff on. But it also has these um, um, little magnetic nameplates that you can put characters' names on. You can do the blue ones for players, red ones for bad guys, green ones for NPCs or animal companions, that kind of thing. And then you just slide them as you go in the, in the order. If you, if it's really easy to move them around if they delay their action or hold an action or whatever. So actually in, in my games, I use this for myself and we use this for the players to know where they're at. So there's two different ways that we're doing it for initiative and it seems to work really well uh, for us. Now granted, we only, only have five players, but I think this would really work well with a large group as well. All right, so what's next on our list? We talked about, oh, another thing with initiative that I do in my games is I will block uh, like mind, uh, similar monsters into one initiative. So let's say, for example, the party's going up against an orc tribe and you have a chieftain or a shaman, you have some archers and you have some general little cannon fodder soldiers. I would group each of those together. So all the archers go together, all the regular soldiers go together, and then the chieftain or the shaman, whatever, goes on his own initiative. You can do that with any kind of monsters that are going to be in that encounter. You block similar ones together and run them at the same initiative. Um, you could also do it where all the monsters go at the same time as well. If you have three or four different kinds of monsters, take the one with the highest initiative and that's the initiative for all the monsters and all the monsters will go on the same time, uh, same turn. So that's another way to do uh, stuff with dealing with initiative and tracking initiative and that kind of thing. Number four is eliminate distractions. You should be talking about this um, as a part of your session zero, your social contract, all that kind of stuff. Yes, there's going to be a long amount of time between your action and when you get to go again. But in order to make sure that everyone is engaged in the story and following along and knowing what they're doing, try to get rid of the cell phones, get rid of player's handbooks, all that kind of stuff at the game, um, and make sure that everybody's aware about non-game related chatter talking about movies or games or what they're doing this weekend, where they're going on vacation, any of that kind of stuff. Try to keep that stuff to a minimum. That's something you need to go over with your players during session zero. Now, one of my groups, we do do the cell phones um, in a box because, let's face it, they're younger players, so they're very active on social media and that kind of thing. And I don't I don't care if you're searching on Twitter for a date or you're playing words with friends or whatever. You need to pay attention to the game. It's more important um, to follow along so we're not waiting on you to you know, to catch you up on where we're at in the, in, the, in the game. So eliminate those distractions. Um, players' handbooks and stuff, get rid of those at the table, um, especially during combat encounters. You don't need to be taking time looking up what your feet does or what your proficiency is or what's the range on your spell. You should know all those things as a player already. And if you don't, you should have written it down in your notebook because no books at the table. All right, so that's some stuff on eliminating distractions. Number five is for you specifically as a GM, rule fast. If you are not going to allow players to take the time to look up what a spell does, that kind of thing, then you shouldn't be doing it as a GM either at the table in the middle of combat. If you don't know what a feat does or whatever, make a ruling on it fast, something that seems fair, something that seems... Um, you can even give the benefit of the doubt and give the advantage to the player 
Uh, if there's any question, just go with it, look it up after the session, and then inform the players uh, if you did something wrong. But make your rulings fast and just move on with the game. Uh, number six, uh, make sure your players are prepared, especially the magic users. The magic users, if, uh, if they use Hero Lab, will have all their spells. They can print all those out. If you're playing D&D, they've got spell cards. They've got a notebook. They can write down exactly what the, the distance, the range, what the spell component costs are, what the saves are, all that kind of stuff. They should have written down so they're not flipping through all these different books to find out what their spell does. It's That's the most important one, especially for spell users. But it would also apply to a barbarian that doesn't know how their rage ability works. It doesn't, um, I mean, it'll still apply to rogues that don't know how sneak attack damage works. They need to know all that stuff. And, and if you emphasize that during session zero, that this is your character, you need to know what they can do and how it works before you come and sit at the table, then they'll, they'll be ready. All right, so the number seven um, way of speeding up games for big groups is to come up with a uh, party stat sheet. This is what I use for my game. I've got the five players across the top here. If you've got a bunch of players, you may have to do it horizontally. But um, I've got all the characters and all of their, their skills, their proficiency stuff. All that can be done along the side so you know what their passive perception is. You know what their stealth modifier is. All of those kind of things that will help you to speed up the game because you're not going to have to ask them to roll for something. Um, it also lists their, um, their AC, their hit points, their saves, their will, fortitude, reflex saves. It's all listed up here as well. So if I have a monster that's attacking the Paladin, for example, I would know that the Paladin has an AC 18. I would know right away if it hits or misses, and that's going to speed up the game. So make one of those sheets out. Get an Excel-type program. I use OpenOffice. Um, but you can find any kind of a spreadsheet program and uh, do that for all of your players. It doesn't take that long to do. All right, uh, number eight, handle all of your mundane stuff out of the game. Both of my campaigns, we have a private Facebook group for the players and myself. So anything that the players want to do that would just drag down a game can all be done outside of the game via messenger, via email, via text message, whatever. Things like um, the the wizard wants to go shopping and it's it's do they have this scroll? Do they have this scroll? Do they have this wand? Do they have this potion? How much is it for this? And blah blah blah. But that's that's a bunch of crap that takes up a lot of time during a game. Handle all that stuff outside of the game. Um, if players have questions about their abilities or when they level up, they can do all their level up stuff outside of the game. You don't need to take game time to do those kind of things. Um, if you have a, a player that, let's say you have a rogue and he wants to go and talk to some members of the, the Thieves Guild, Instead of taking that player to another room to have that conversation, and if that's a 10, 15 minute little role play side trek that we're doing, then everybody else is just sitting there. And unless you have a co-GM or an assistant GM that can continue on while you do that, those are things that are gonna be best saved for outside of the game unless they're going to specifically impact the game that you are playing at that moment. If there's an NPC shopkeep that, yes, you want the players to go there to, to buy armor or to sell their armor or buy a potion or whatever because that shopkeep has a quest for them, then that's fine. But all the other stuff, save it for outside of the game if, if at all possible. All right, uh, number nine. Most of the time, 
when when the players are going to have to do something and they need to strategize about it, even my groups of five players can take a horrendously long amount of time if you let them. Talking about who's doing what and what their strategy is and all that kind of stuff. Now, to combat that, we use timers. This is just a little sand timer. You can get packs of these um, on Amazon and eBay and at dollar stores and all that kind of stuff. And they come in different times. This one is a 30 second timer. But when your players are going to start strategizing on how to attack the orc camp, for example, use whatever whatever time you think is, a, is appropriate, whether it's two minutes or five minutes or 10 minutes, whatever. But grab that timer and flip it over and say, all right, you've got five minutes to figure out your strategy for attacking that orc camp, and then you're going. We need to move this along. And uh, they'll get used to that, and they'll get used to making concessions and thinking on their feet faster when it comes to strategizing. All right, let's move along to number 10. Use comprehensive setting descriptions once at the beginning of an encounter. It really, it really peeves me when players do not pay attention and I have to explain something over and over and over again. And when you've got 10 players at your table and every third player is asking you to describe something again that you've already described, the easiest way to combat that is to say, all right, everybody, pay attention. Here is the map of the woods that you are in. This boulder right here is six feet tall. This stream that's over here, although it's only about 10 feet wide, it is three feet deep and rapidly moving. This area over here on the map is quicksand or difficult terrain. This brush, these trees over here are impassable. They're, they're tangled with vines and thorns and all that kind of stuff. You can't get through them. So if you explain all that stuff to them at the very beginning, then they should know during that encounter, they should, should not have to ask, well, how high is that boulder? How deep is that stream? All of those kind of things. And the same thing goes for dungeons as well. If they're in a dungeon or a cavern or whatever, you can say, Normally, the tunnels in here are going to be 8 feet tall or 10 feet tall or whatever. And they're going to be just regular smooth stone on the sides, whatever. If anything odd, um, as you go down a hallway and you make a turn, if there's anything odd, I will tell you at that time. But as a general rule, this is the way things work in this particular area, on this map, on this terrain board, whatever get all that out of the way you make sure everybody's paying attention and you don't have to repeat yourself with players asking questions over and over again all right number 11 is um, as a gm instead of rolling monster damage just write down on their stat sheet or your index card or your notebook whatever you're using just write down the average damage if you have a, a, a creature that does a bite and claw, two different claw damages, that kind of thing, just write down the average. It's so much easier to use average monster damage. You know, you just roll the d20. Okay, yep, I know by your, your sheet um, that it hits your AC and it's going to do seven points of damage. It's just quick and easy, and that's not going to slow things down during your games. All right, number 12, um, slowing the leveling of your party. Now, leveling up is a really cool part of our games because you feel like you're accomplishing something as a player. Oh, I'm getting better. I'm getting stronger and faster and smarter and I'm learning new spells and oh, now I can do this cool thing with my sword and whatever. And that's fun and I get that. I get that. I truly do. But if we as GMs are, are GMing for a larger group, when you slow their leveling down, um, stretch it out basically, you're doing it for a reason. And the main reason to do it is because as your PCs level up, so do the monsters. The monsters become more complicated. The monsters become much tougher. 
And that leads to longer encounters, longer combat encounters with those monsters. So the higher your PCs level up in a big group, the, the tougher monsters you got to throw at them, and it's just going to make the combats even longer. So Jed, when you're talking about having really long combat encounters, that's one thing that you can use to slow them down a little bit and slow down uh, and make the combats run a little bit faster, hopefully. And we'll talk more about encounters here in just a second. But All right, so the 13th thing is to set room DCs. And if you go on, uh, if you're uh, on YouTube, up in the search bar, search for the Runehammer channel. So Runehammer Room DC. And Hankern has an amazing video on setting room DCs and how he does it in his games. Basically, you plop down the map, you plop down the terrain board, and you have a little folded index card or whatever, and it just has DC 14 on it. Anything that the PC wants to do in that room, they know that it's a DC 14. If they want to walk across this slippery log to get on the other side of the river... DC 14. If they want to hit the orc, his AC is 14. If they want to climb up this, this sheer cliff, climb check is a DC 15, 14, whatever it is. Whatever we had written down on that card. But if everything is all the same, there's, there's not going to be any question. Everybody's going to know if they make it, if they don't make it. GM, players, everybody. It's going to make things go a lot faster with you. So head on over to Runehammer and check out that video because it's pretty cool. All right. So number 14, let players play monsters if they're bored between turns. If you have a very experienced player and they're not playing something a little more difficult like a spellcaster, if they're playing a, a normal fighter or a ranger or whatever, those kind of things that aren't so intensive as, as to figuring out what they're going to do, you have a fighter that, that goes first in initiative, and you have a monster that's going to go halfway through the initiative order, and they look like they're getting bored. Here, here's the stats for those goblins. You are now in charge of all the goblin archers. Give them something to do so they're not bored. That's one cool thing to do. Yeah. Something that I do as well. Um, I actually have a webcam, and I record the videos, uh, record the sessions that I play. And the reason I do that is it frees up my time from taking notes during a session. I can take the notes afterwards when I'm re-watching the, uh, the video. Um, or you can ask the players to, to take notes during the game, something like that. That frees up a lot of time for you. You can focus on the story. You can focus on who's going next and actions of the bad guys, the monsters, that kind of thing. All right, so the final thing that we're going to talk about is um, encounters, and I'll try and do this as quickly as possible because I can see that this is already becoming a long video as well. Um, encounters can become tricky when you're talking about multiple players, especially if they're at different levels for their characters. If you've got some that are level 3, some that are level 4, some that are level 5, um, you need to be really careful with your encounters because if they're too easy then those players that had a crappy initiative aren't even going to get to act before the bad guy's dead. If it's too tough on them it's just going to slow everything down and drag out this combat encounter when it doesn't need to be. So how do you uh, how are you going to make your encounters for this large group? The, the best way I think of doing it is to go online and check out Cobalt Fight Club. There you can put in your number of players, the level of the characters, and that kind of stuff, and you can pick terrain and whatever, and it'll come up with some, some good balanced, type, well, balanced encounters um, for you. So Cobalt Fight Club is one thing to check out. But as a general rule, if you take the CR, the challenge rating of the party, and double it, and if you have an exceptionally large group, like uh, 9, 10, 11 players in the group, <coughs> excuse me, you can even add another one to that. And you split that out over two, three, maybe four monsters. You don't want to give them a whole bunch of minions, because the more minions that you add to the table, even though they're easy and quick to kill, 
it's just going to bog everything down and your encounter is going to take longer. So what you want to do is you really want to do quality over quantity. And bigger monsters are going to be more threatening to the to the player, to the party, the characters. Um, and that excitement, that fear of fighting a Tarask or a, a dragon or something like that is going to keep them involved and interested in the game during combat. They're going to focus. So, whew, has a lot of different tips on different things that you can do, Jed, and anybody else out there that's dealing with um, larger groups. Basically, if you are able to use a webcam and record your sessions, that, that's great because you can you can watch it, you can review and analyze what is slowing your games down. And it's kind of that 80-20 rule. 80% of the things that are slowing your game down are only caused by 20% of the things that are in your game. So if you're able to review it and analyze it and fix that 20% of the problem, um, then 80% of your time waste is going to go away. So, with all that said, disregard all of that if everyone in your party is having fun because that's the most important thing. If everybody's having fun, even with these long drawn out encounters and all that kind of stuff, if they're having fun, don't sweat it. And like I always say, if you learned something in today's video, hit the like button, hit the subscribe button uh, for our new videos that'll be coming out. Um, click the little bell notifier thing. We're not super stringent on we're going to come out with a video every week or you know two videos a week or whatever. It's just whenever I have time to record a video, I'm going to record a video and edit it and post it. So click the little bell notifier on there. Um, you can also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. The links are going to be in the description for those two. If you want to chat more between videos and... Uh, Till next time, have a great gaming week. Oh man, another long video. I gotta find topics that aren't controversial and I don't have a ton of stuff that I need to say about them. This is taking forever. Anyway, sorry about the another long video, but uh, lots of good tips in there, I think. But uh, anyway, now I got to go round up the turtles. So, see you, nerds. <laughs>